What up, everybody? This is your boy, Dedrick Cologne from House of Wrestling. This is my review for the May 4th episode of AEW Dynamite. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Follow House of Wrestling on all social media platforms. Follow me, Dedrick180, on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. Man, tonight's AEW Dynamite, it was fun. Um, it had a lot of moments you were looking forward to. A um, few moments, it was okay. Uh, but for the most part, it was a fun show. Um, it, this really built towards the Owen Hart men's side of the tournament. Uh, the women's side, eh, see after Rampage this week. But overall, man, this show was really fun. Um, no CM Punk, which was like, oh, man, no CM Punk. Oh, crap. But, of course, we know that he's been filming uh, scenes for Heels Season 2, I believe. Uh, but man, this was a really cool show. It started off with Adam Cole on commentary, and the first match was Jeff Hardy versus Bobby Fish in the Owen Hart uh, Cup tournament. Uh, this was really cool. What I didn't notice about this show up until like ha halfway through the show that this is the same arena that Ring of Honor has used, uh, I believe, for the whole pandemic. Maybe I think so. And where most of their pay-per-views were at, because they were in Baltimore. I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. But, man, this first match, Jeff Hardy and Bobby Fish, really cool match. Uh, one thing I have noticed about Jeff Hardy uh, in his singles matches in AEW, he's actually using, he's actually becoming more strategic um, in a subtle way that I don't think anybody's noticing. Um He's actually, the spots that he's choosing to use is high spots that he's known for for the past 20 plus years. Um, he's doing it at calculated spots where it's not like, you know, he's just going 100 miles an hour, boom, 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 where he's more, okay, I'll do it here, boom. All right, let me take this guy's leg out. Oh, let me do this. Let me do it. I really, I'm, I'm digging his style because it fits who he's fighting against. And it also fits that. Hey, you know, this is Jeff Hardy who's been in the industry for 20 years. So a lot of the spots that he's taken have some wear and tear on his body. So he's got to be, you know, smarter um, and quicker and clever and just strategic. Like, oh, boom, boom, boom. And hey, the guys, I like this. Um, but Bobby Fish, most of the match, he was very technical attacking Jeff Hardy's legs uh, when he could, arm or what have you. I enjoyed that. Uh, of course, Sting and Darby were in the rafters, which I like that. And now that I think about it, it was kind of a foretelling of who could win this match. Um, it's always a cool sight to see Sting and Darby in the rafters. It's just fun. Uh, then we had Bobby Fish do a Falcon Arrow from the top rope. Um, at first, it looked scary because I'm like, okay, what is he going to do? Is he like... What is this? Like, he took his time and everything. Um, at first, I'm like, okay, he's going to perform a superplex on Jeff Hardy. Like, all right. And when he did the Falcon Arrow, like, at first, it just looked like, oh, my God, what? Ha oh, that's a Falcon Arrow. Like, the way the camera angles were, just like, oh, my God. But it was it was good that he executed. Uh, then we had uh, Bobby Fish turn that Falcon Arrow into a ankle lock, which he held on. Jeff Hardy wound up kicking out of that. Uh, Jeff Hardy got some offense in, went to the top, got the Swanton Bomb. One, two, three. Jeff Hardy moves on in the Owen Hart Cup tournament. Uh, later in this episode, they revealed that uh, Jeff Hardy is going to be taking on Darby Allen in the first round of the Owen Hart Cup tournament. That's going to be cool. Um, I could see why people are like, oh, that should be on a pay-per-view but you got to look at it this way. And I actually like this, that it gives meaning to their first encounter um, instead of just, hey, let's have them in a match. Um, because that's been somewhat of a dream match for the past three years, Darby Allen and Jeff Hardy. Now that you have them in the same company, have it have meaning. So when they meet again, there's a history like, hey, I beat you in the tournament, but Let's see if you can do it again, and let's add something to it. Plus, what I liked was after this match, you had the Young Bucks confronting 
the Hardys, and of course the last time that the Hardys and Young Bucks pretty much had a match was in 2017, literally the day of their WrestleMania return in Orlando when they won the Raw Tag Team titles. I believe that was WrestleMania 30... Was it 30... This is 38, 34, 33, 33, 34. I don't know. I always get those two mixed up, but it was 2017 WrestleMania. Um, so, I mean, let's see what happens. Uh, they have been teasing the delete, the delete, the delete. Are we going to get Broken Matt and Brother Nero? Um, aesthetically, it would be cool because uh, seeing Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy in their old um, Hardy's gear, it's cool, but like, it's just something about that broken mat and Brother Nero aesthetic. It just fits a vibe that AEW is uh, giving off to the fans and everything. And for me personally, I was a fan of that ultimate deletion. And it'd be cool to see that on AEW. Um, then we get a video package of William Regal and the Blackpool uh, Combat Club. Uh, they actually showed a portion of it because the full video was on um social media and they cut like half of it off but it was really intense one thing that i took away from that was when william Regal was talking about you know if people get stabbed then you know somewhere down the line they'll forget it but if you give someone a scar they'll have to look at it reminder and just that whole like how he was explaining it was just like you guys just want to beat the hell out of people and leave marks and stuff. Like, man, that's it was a really cool video. Um, I recommend you guys check it out. Um, it's probably one of his best videos so far in AEW. Um, and the visual of them training, it's like, ooh, man, this is so good. But let's see who joins the Blackpool Combat Club. I have a few people in mind that I wouldn't mind joining, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, then we get a trios match. Uh, we get Danielson, Moxley, and Yuta versus the Butcher Blade and Angelico. Man, in this match, I liked that uh, Angelico got to show off a few submission holds. He's done very few of those when he was with, uh, uh, was it 2H2 Hybrid? Uh, what, was, what was their name? Hybrid? When he was with uh, Jack Evans and stuff like that. Like He showcased a little bit. But it wasn't to what uh, he did during this match, of course, against Brian Danielson and John Moxley. Where you, this was really cool. Um, Moxley, when he came out to the ring, um, he got attacked right away by the butcher. It was like, oh crap! Okay, this is cool. Like that, like those instances where you have a like you don't expect it just happens. Like I wish AEW would do more of that. Um, you know, either have more more of those moments or tighten up the shot so you don't see the guy coming. I remember when Malachi Black kicked Cody Rhodes when he was a uh, gorilla. Like you didn't see that coming. That freaking leg just phew, knocked him the hell out. Um. So yeah, we had that. Then to start the match off, uh, the blade was bleeding. I don't know how that occurred, uh, but it just added to the match because let's face it, you saw the promo that William Regal was giving. And you're facing Brian Danielson, John Moxley, and Will Yuta, which they've had bloody matches. So it's like, eh, it fits these guys. Uh, then we had, oh, man, trying to see where, because there was a, there was some, there was some clubbing going on in this match. Um, there was a point where Moxley, when uh, during the match, that him and like, he literally took the blade all around the ring almost before they went to commercial. Um, I thought that was pretty cool because you could tell uh, Yuta and Danielson are the more technical, let's get you in a hold in a ring. Moxie's just more like, yeah, I can get you in a hold, but first I just want to beat the hell out of you with any weapon that's around the ring. And that's it. I, I like that. I like that dynamic. It was entertaining. Um, then you had... Uh, everybody, you had Moxley in a submission, uh, and was he had the butcher, yeah, he had the butcher in a submission hold, 
then Will Ryuta had Angelico in a submission. No, he had the blade in a submission hold. And then Brian Danielson did his usual kicks to Angelico, which that visual, when they do that, that's so cool because I believe that's the third or fourth week that they've done that where uh, Brian Danielson goes to do his kicks and uh, Moxley and uh, Yuta do that. Actually, the first time it was Yuta and Moxley and Danielson went and did their submission hold. So I really like that continuity that they do that. Um, something for Ring of Honor. I like, I've seen that a few times in Ring of Honor. Uh, but man, this was, this was a really cool match. Uh, of course, Brian Danielson did the triangle sleeper on Angelico. One, two, three. That was the match. I liked that match. It was fun. Um, it was to the point, of course, you kind of knew who Blackpool Pool, uh, Blackpool Combat Club uh, was going to win. Um, it was somewhat of a, you could say, a high-profile squash match. But, I mean, Butcher Blade and Helico are really exceptional wrestlers. And, like I said, man, I, I like this match. I like what they're doing with the Blackpool Combat Club. Um, I'm really interested to see who is it going to be their first feud. Um, because they're in a stage of like, okay, they're, uh, they've come together and they're just forming some chemistry. And now like, when is going to be that first test of that chemistry? Like, okay, let's see if these guys can actually overcome, which I'm looking forward to then seeing who it will be. Um, I wouldn't mind if it's Andrade Rush and Dragon Lee bring back Los Idonables. Woo, that'd be sweet. Uh, then we get a backstage segment with Ricky Starks and Powers Hobbs. They're pretty much asking for the uh, tag team titles. And then you have uh, Jurassic Express. They interrupt. And basically what we're going to get is Jungle Boy versus Ricky Star uh, Ricky Stark. I was going to call him Ricky Hobbs. Ricky Starks for the FTW title, I believe. Uh, next week, yeah, next week we're going to get that. I don't know if it's on Rampage or Dynamite. Forgive me, guys. Um, but eventually we are going to get Ricky Starks and Hobbs versus the Jurassic Express. I've been saying it. They need to put those titles on uh, Starks and Hobbs because they have the chemistry. Um, I just feel the first few weeks that Jurassic Express have had the titles. It's been, ah, okay, but it just feels like there's so many other teams that have more momentum and there's other teams that people are talking about more than Jurassic Express that it's to the point that you forget that Jurassic Express are the tag team champions, which you really don't want that, uh, you know, more so for the belts and for the wrestlers, especially Jurassic Express. Like, you really don't want that because they're all talented, but you just don't want them in a position where it's like, People forget they're the champs, and they're the champs. And they're talking about everybody else. It's like, you might as well just switch it to them and then figure out what direction you want to go with Jurassic Express. But I'm looking forward to that match, Ricky Starks versus Jungle Boy. I hope Ricky Starks wins, and I wish and I hope that Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs become the new uh, tag team champions. Uh, this segment, it got to the point. It didn't overstay his welcome. Um... I wish there would have been a little bit more. A lot of these promos, I wish there was there's a little bit more intense intensity, feistiness, um, a little bit more aggression in here. Like, hey, this guy's trying to stop you from advancing in the rankings, and you know, he's screwing you out of this opportunity, and you know, you lose a match, you drop in the rankings. Like, I wish there was more of that feistiness in these promos. Um, but let me know what you guys think in the comments below. So we get to a backstage segment with um, Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee. And basically, Swerve's like, we're going to pay your ass back for the stuff that you guys cost us in the matches. Um, and Keith Lee basically says, you're going to swerve uh, in our glory. Look, that's you got FTR, you got Swerve and Keith Lee, and you got Starks and Hobbs right now that are like the hottest tag teams right now. If somehow you can get a triple threat with those guys right now while they're hot, and let's say you get it at double or nothing, man. FTR, 
Swear Strickland, and Keith Lee, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Ricky Starks. A triple threat tag team match with those guys. Sweet. And, of course, I know we had that at Revolution, but look, let's face it, man. If you got three hot teams right now, put them in there. And actually, I would do it. I wouldn't have it a triple threat. I would just have an elimination match. Like, you got to go bounce, you're out. Um, but I'm looking forward to what's going to happen with them. Um, I honestly believe uh, Ricky Starks and Hobbs are going to be the tag champs pretty soon. And I believe at some point, uh, Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee are going to be tag team champions uh, probably sometime in the summer in AEW. Uh, then we get to Wardlow's match. So he comes out with no security guards. I really am enjoying this uh, MJF Wardlow feud. Um, man, it's just fun. Like, it's fun. It's different. Um, it's building Warlow. Uh, the only concern for me is where do they go once the story's over with Wit Warlow? Like, who is he going to feud with? Who is he going to align with? You know, what's the progression going to be like for Warlow? That's my only concern. Um, but until then, I'm just enjoying a ride right now between him and MJF. So he gets to the ring and MJF, uh, there's just number of views. Like these people freaking hate uh, MJF. Um, calls out Wardlow's opponent. It is none other than Impact Wrestling's. And then the commentary made this point. They really addressed him as Impact Wrestling's William Morrissey. So now we got an Impact wrestler coming in AEW. So now Impact Wrestling is. Having wrestlers appear on their programming, which is pretty cool. So now that we have an Impact wrestler showing up in AEW, not the only one because we had Deron Peraza later on. So who are the AEW wrestlers that are going to be appearing on Impact Wrestling Television? Remains to be seen. It's going to be interesting. I got to watch tomorrow night. And actually, tomorrow's my birthday. So uh, wish me happy birthday, guys. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to what's going to happen with that. But man, this was a pretty... Solid match for two big guys. Um, shout out to William Morrissey. Man, the guy has done a 180 since he was in WWE. Um, I've liked the stuff that he's been doing in Impact Wrestling since he's been there. Um, he is a totally different wrestler. Man, if I if there is some comparison to the growth that he's made uh, right now, I would say... To big men in the past. I would say that. Man he's. Man I would say he's. He's actually. Here's the comparison. William Morrissey right now. Is what Sid Vicious was in 97, 98. When he was in WWF and in ECW. Like that's where. That's actually. That's a perfect example. Uh, of where he's at. Because. Both years, Sid was hot. Uh, it wasn't until he went to WCW. Of course, WCW was ugh, the way they were booking stuff. You know, as you know that um, you know the level and just the momentum that Sid had kind of like diminished once he joins WCW. But what he had in WWF in '97 and '98 in ECW, that was it. But yeah, WCW Morrissey. This was a cool match. They actually. Uh, Showed and acknowledged John Harbaugh, uh, head coach of the Baltimore Ravens, because they were in Baltimore and everything. So they acknowledged them. Um, Morrissey gave a big boot to freaking Wardlow. This was a big, um, they were laying into each other. Um, this wasn't your sloth big men style match. Um, this actually had more of a like an impact wrestling type vibe as far as how impact wrestling has their matches with their big guys. Like, this was really cool. Um, there was a point where the crowd was chanting, we want Enzo. And then the other crowd was like, no, we don't. Um, I eventually, I do expect those guys to come back together because Enzo's doing some pretty cool stuff in MLW and he's jacked up. So, I mean, it's eventually something's going to happen where those guys are going to come back together. and Because they were freaking super hot in WWF. And just whatever happened, it just didn't work out. But... Uh, both those guys seem to be in a really good place, and 
I look forward to seeing those guys come back together and uh, perform, whether it's Impact, AEW, or Ring of Honor. I know it's eventually going to happen. Um, then there was a point in the match where uh, W. Morrison, I love this man. He was going to try to do a superplex. Warlow um, knocked him off, and then Warlow did a, a moonsault on W. Morrison. It was like, whoa, and like the athleticism that Moore, uh, Warlow showcasing, man. This is this is special, man. This is special. Right now, I like it now, but eventually he may have to I don't know, man. We'll see. But I think eventually he's gonna have to like tone it down a little bit because you know those high spots for big guys, his size, man. One wrong move, man. You don't want that to happen, but we'll see what happened. But I I love that spot. Uh of course he did his power bomb. One, two, three. He defeated Morrissey. That was that was a match. I I liked it. Uh, then post match, Warlow, he's basically telling MJF, "I'm going to destroy you. Um, I won't stop till I get my hands on you, and you release me from my contract." MJF uh, basically says, "Okay, you're going to get what you want. We're going to get a contract signing in my hometown of Long Island next week, and." What else did he say? Uh, and I'll see you at Double or Nothing. So apparently we're getting this match at Double or Nothing, which is going to be fun. Um, that's going to be a... I, I would say that's going to be one of the most anticipated matches in AEW history because of how they built it. Um, and it's probably going to be one of the most anticipated matches where you wanted to see a guy get beat the, like get the living dog shit beat out of him because he's so annoying um and that man you haven't had that type of match in a long time um hell, i'm trying to think of when something like that's transpired it's been it's been a while um i don't want to say 10 15 20 years it's been a while that you've had a match like that we're just like man just beat the hell out of this guy uh then we get a backstage segment with Britt baker jamie hater tony storm uh and Ruby Soho. So apparently they're going to have an opening match on this Friday's uh, Rampage. And Ruby, she tells uh, Britt Baker she's got a receipt coming. These backstage segments are okay. Um, it is kind of repetitive. Um, you're starting to see. I wish it was a backstage a beat down or attack something different a confrontation that was just random that wasn't prepared and being civil or anything like that um yeah i just i don't know man it's they they need to they need to they need to really uh tighten the screws on a women's division and really uh give them some some depth to what they're trying to tell uh, people with their women's division. Because this segment, I mean, it felt like a repeat of the last two segments they've had backstage with Tony Schiavone. So it was just like, okay, like, you got to do something. Now, I'll I'll say this. If there is, let's say someone is slightly injured or was slightly injured and they're using this as to keep them on TV, that's understandable. That happens most of the time. Uh, but for the most part, it's like, Hey, can we like put someone in a match? I know that they're fighting in the uh, tournament and everything, but it's like, can we like get something other than this? Um, it's almost like the Sting interviews that they had when Sting first debuted, where it was just nothing but Sting interviews for three months. So then we get to a promo by Hangman Page and. I'll just say this. This surprised me because not so much that he was Hangman Page giving an interview and everything, but it was the way Hangman Page was talking and really talking towards the fan. He told one flan who had a CM Punk shirt, uh, yeah, if you uh after I'm done with him, you're gonna run back to the uh merchandise stand and ask for a refund. Like he was very condescending towards the fans, uh, very heelish. So it's 
I'm, I'm starting to think that we might get CM Punk uh, winning that AEW world title, and we might get Adam Page turning heel, which, now that I think about it, it's something to keep in mind. For those of you going to watch this review, could Adam Page be joining the Bullet Club? Keep that in mind. Could Adam Page be turning the Bullet Club if he loses the world title? Or, and this is wild, reckless speculation that's been, that's kind of the common theme now uh, with these predictions. Or, is CM Punk joining the Bullet Club? Ooh, maybe? I don't know. But yeah, this promo, check it out. Man, he was very condescending. Like, this was not Hangman Page, uh, typical face. Like, this was a very heelish Adam Page. Uh, he reminded me of Shawn Michaels 97, right before he turned full on heel. Like, he had that vibe. It's like, ooh, we're getting the feisty Adam Page. He pretty much addressed, oh, Adam, CM Punk's not here because he's filming, uh, some more TV stuff and just very condescending. It's like, oh boy, this is gonna be this is gonna be some good stuff when CM Punk returns. Uh, then we get a backstage segment with Sandam Singh, Jay Lethal, and Sanjay Dutt. Uh, basically, this is hyping up the Jay Lethal uh, Ketusha match, I believe, on Rampage. And they, uh, what is it? Sanjay Dutt. He just randomly mentions like, yeah. We'll see you on Rampage at, was it, 5.30 Eastern? And I'm like, wait a minute, so is Rampage starting at 4.30 Central time on Friday? Like, I know the NBA playoffs are like, and the NHL like, damn. So apparently AW Rampage, if you're living in the Midwest, um, like I am in Chicago, uh, Rampage is starting at like 4.30 uh, Central time on Friday. Yeah. I'll take it. I mean, it's crazy to watch wrestling at 4.30 in the afternoon. I mean, the last time I saw wrestling on a weekday at like 4.30 in the afternoon, live, was shit, the 90s with uh, ESPN with the AWA when X-Pac was wrestling. But it is we'll see what happens. So uh, I know Katusha's had some really good matches, so we'll see where that goes with him. Uh, then we get the Santana Jericho match. Um, yeah, this match. Um, I don't know if they're waiting to add more member. Like, basically, Jericho and Santana was just back and forth match, and um, Jericho low blowed Santana and pinned Santana one two three. Um, similar to what happened with Eddie Kingston, it's a five on two uh, advantage. And, of course, everyone, like myself, is like, okay, who's going to help Eddie Kingston and Santana Ortiz? Like, who are the two guys that's going to, you know, even it up? Tonight it was five on two. Usually it's five on three. So, like, okay, who's the two guys that's going to even it up? Um, you know, there are a lot of speculation. Is it uh, Homicide and Hernandez? You know, who? And I think now we're to the point, like, okay, they're, like, Okay, when is it going to happen? Because uh, we're getting a lot of beatdowns of Santana and Ortiz. And it's only been one time that they've had the upper hand. Every time, every other time, it's just been all Jericho Appreciation Society having the advantage over uh, Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz. So it's like, okay, who's going to, like, what's going to happen? Like, who's going to join them? So um, we'll see where that goes. But that's, that. Kind of goes along the same lines as the Britt Baker, uh, Jamie Hayter, Ruby Soho, Tony. St like, okay, like let's let's get it on already. Let's let's go. Um, you know, stop repeating the same thing or put someone else in there. Like, come on, let's go. Uh, then we get a backstage segment with Samoa Joe. Um, he basically calls out Jay Lethal. He's like, Brave Men make challenges you don't make challenges but i'll get you when i see you that was it like that was a really quick uh segment which i don't know it's 
it was okay. Like I love Samoa Joe, but like how quick it was and just what he said, like it was just like it was like a filler promo. Like I don't know, they could have added more. I don't know. It was just honestly they could have they could have saved that for like Rampage or something like that. Um, because yeah, this was just all right. It was it is what it is. So then you get a backstage segment with the club or the club, uh, the Gun Club and the Acclaimed, and basically. Uh, it's actually kind of funny. So they gifted the acclaimed scissors and Billy Gunn's like, come on, put it in there. And it's like, what? It's like, what? So apparently the gun club and the acclaimed are now a big, uh, happy family or a faction or what have you. Uh, that should be interesting and it should be cool because, uh, Max Caster and Austin Gunn are rappers. So is this leading towards them? working as a cohesive unit and, you know, as a faction, or is this going to eventually lead to Max Caster and Austin Gunn having a rap battle, which I've heard both of them are pretty good. Uh, We'll see where that goes. Um, It's entertaining. I mean, the crowd loves the acclaimed, and they they, that's another team that eventually they're going to have to put more on TV because the more the crowd's behind them, you can't leave them uh off dynamite you can put them on okay dark and you know people are gonna love them but like eventually it's like hey you gotta put them on dynamite and rampage or whatever show like you gotta put them more on tv uh then we get uh the varsity blondes they call out the house of black um i was really hoping for brian pillman to join the house of black i was hoping and then halfway through i was hoping that griff Garrison would join the House of Black. Give him something, like, give these guys something new. Like, um, I enjoy Brian Pillman and Griff Garrison, their look, but, like, the varsity uh, blondes, like, whole aesthetic, it's so 1990s. Like, it's night, like, I get the dynamic dudes' vibes from the varsity blondes. Like, no, these guys are in 2022. They have an attitude and an edge that is underneath all this aesthetic varsity blondes. Hey, we're babyface. Like, no, there's an edge to these guys that needs to be brought out. And eventually it is brought out. Um, and eventually Brody King, um, Malachi Black and Buddy Matthews, they come in. They beat the hell out of them. Uh, Julie Hart's in the corner. Um, Malachi Black, he brings her out. She has the chair. She starts laughing. Um you were anticipating, I was anticipating her hitting the chair and she starts laughing. And then Malachi Black takes the chair, um, which that's what I mean. Like, it was weird when that happens. Like, all right, what's happening here? And they take the the eye patch off and she's covering it. And Pillman and Garrison are there laying there. And then you get Death Triangle come in for the save. I don't know. It was just, I, I think now is to the point like they're prolonging too much for the house of black where it's like okay you got to get to the point with these guys because like you've been dragging us out so long like okay either put Julia Hart in there or just have them move on like you got to get this going and of course we know that they've been waiting for Ray Phoenix to return so you can have house of black versus death triangle which goes into the next match Ray Phoenix Dante Martin man this was a fun match this is a match that if you wanted to show your friends um, just a little bit like, hey, this is why I watch AEW. You know, hey, you got to check out these guys. Like, man, this is a fun match. Uh, this guy, you know, of course, Ray Phoenix, uh, Lucha Underground. But, man, this Dante Martin is an up-and-coming wrestler. Check this out. This was fun. This was a fun, fun match. The spot of the freaking match. The This was crazy. It was a Spanish fly from the middle turnbuckle. That Ray Phoenix did on um, Dante Martin. Like, that was so fluid. And, like, he took him from the ground, jumped on her, and then did the... Sp- Man, that was so... This th- this was, like I always say, like, AEW has those moments, especially with guys like Ray Phoenix and Dante Martin, where they, they, they take you back to the uh, TNA Ultimate X Division or the X Division from, like, 2004 to 2008 to the, like, 
WCW cruiserweights during the Monday Night Wars, like that type of vibe. And this was this was it. This was this was a fun match, man. This was a really fun match. Uh, the other spot was the um was it the Spanish Fly that again Ray Phoenix actually no it was Dante Martin was it Dante Martin no it was Ray Phoenix doing a Spanish fly on Darte Martin from the top turnbuckle, the top rope. They did it, but both of them landed both on their feet, and they just looked at each other, and I thought that was so cool, and they're just like, God, you know my timing. And then after that, uh, Ray Phoenix performed the inverted suplex pile driver. I believe that's the move. One, two, three. Ray Phoenix moves on into the um, Owen Hart tournament. Um, he's actually facing Kyle O'Reilly, which I'm looking forward to that match. That is going to be a dope match. Um, I, I like how AEW with the men, they need to do this with the women. Um, it's starting, get, starting to get back to those. Ooh, wow. This is a match I never thought I wanted to see, but now I'm going to see it. Like, ooh, this, this is going to be interesting. Um, especially with the men's side, but the women's side, they really need to like, come on, you got to pick up the intensity and just you know, the aggression in these storylines and implement it, you know, throughout the show and integrate it because it's like you got some talented women, you got to showcase them. Uh, but, man, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they did uh, shake each other's hands and everything, which is a cool moment. It'll be fun to see Dante Martin and Ray Phoenix in the tag team. Whew. Boy, that'll be fun. Uh, then we get a backstage segment with Darby Allen and Sting. And basically, he's talking about his match against Jeff Hardy. It's going to be a special night. Then Sting gives in. You know, it's like, yeah, this is Jeff. I know you're going to bring it, but Darby's going to bring it too. This goes in line with the Samoa Joe uh, promo. Like, they really didn't need it. They could have just put it on Rampage or something like that or just not do it at all. Like, it really didn't, like, like they really didn't say anything that, like, ooh, I want to see this match. It was like, eh, okay. Um, that's just how it came across not saying that was their intention but you guys get what i'm saying Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below uh then we get a promo from thunder rosa uh basically saying that you know she wants to establish the women's division serena deeb uh gets called out by her serena deeb's like you know in order for us to establish this division the best woman's wrestler needs to have the gold and that's me um as they started the promo, I thought, man, this is taken away from, like, the women's main event. Like, man, this is, ooh, this is getting close. And it felt like they were going to drag it on. And eventually it got to the point where Serena Deeb's like, you know what? I'll see you at double or nothing. So we're apparently getting Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb at double or nothing. That's going to be a banger match. Um, looking forward to that. Man, it's just... Like I've been saying, man, they need to. There's a way to incorporate the women where it means more than what they're doing now, because um, it does come across in a way that the women are on just to have them on, and not so much. Okay, we have them on, but man, there's this this story behind this that we're going here as they do with the men. Like it's just there's gaps missing with the women's storytelling in uh, AEW's women's division. Uh, then we get a rundown. They mention CM Punk uh, or Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen next week. That should be fun. And then they mention uh, they cut to a quick interview with John Silver, and of course he gives you know these meaty guns, and it's going to be John Silver versus CM Punk. And that's three interviews, three like interview like packages. That really, they really didn't need on, like, honestly, they could have just announced a match. And just, I don't know, they could have just announced a match. Like, you really, like, again, this is something else that they, like, yeah, John Silver spoke, but, like, he didn't really say anything that gets you, like, oh, man, I want to see this match. Or, ooh, that was a clever line. It was just like, yeah, I'm here. It's like, okay. Uh, then we get to the main event. We get Mercedes Martinez versus Deanna Peraza. Uh... Deanna Peraza basically started with no code of honor, didn't shake the hands or anything like that. Uh, Then we get, uh, there was a cool spot where Spear, uh, Mercedes Martinez did on Deanna Peraza. 
uh, there was a Fujinami armbar by Dorana Peraza. I love when she does that armbar because, man, she does it at the most, like, unexpected time. We're like, oh, crap. Like, wait a minute. Is she going to win? And it's not early on in the match. It's usually as the match is past, like, maybe nine, ten minutes. We're just like, oh, crap. Like, is she going to win? Like, is she really going to win? And no, Mercedes kicked out. Um, then there was a point where, uh, Mercedes Martinez did the Romeo, I believe that's called the Romeo special, the legs behind her legs and rocking her back. And she had her like that and she put the dragon sleeper in. I was expecting the match to go a little bit longer and Deanna Peraza tapped. That was it. So Mercedes Martinez is the undisputed ring of honor women's champion. Uh, that's how the show closed. I liked it. Um, I like that Thunder Rosa, Serena D, Mercedes Martinez, and Deanna Peraza pretty much were the last 25 minutes of the show. So you got women on the last uh, part of Dynamite, which I liked. Um, they that should be that should be a uh, a regular occurrence, not a weekly occurrence, but it should be something that we should be. Um, accustomed to on AEW, whether it's been like we should be accustomed to seeing the women main event on Dynamite uh, regularly. Uh, but man, this overall, this show was it was fun. It was a fun show. I was looking forward to it. Um, I would say, man, it, it's hard to say which segment stood out, but because there were so many little things that really were like, oh, this is cool. Oh, man, this is cool. Oh, this is cool. Oh, this is cool. Um, but I would say that. Um, Ray Phoenix, Darby Allen match, uh, or Ray Phoenix, Dante Martin match. That was a fun match. Please go out of your way. See that. It was fun. Um, I think honestly, now looking back on it, if you take away the three videos that they did with Samoa Joe, uh, Sting and John Silver, um, you could have added maybe another two, three minutes to the Dante Martin, um, Ray Phoenix match. Maybe it was because Ray Phoenix has returned back from injury, so they really didn't want to do a lot of high spots. But man, that was a really cool match. Um, I'm really looking forward to Ray Phoenix versus um, Kyle O'Reilly. But again, my dream match. Um, I have this as my dream match on the House of Wrestling channel. Um, Jeff Hardy defeating Bobby Fish. We're going to get Jeff Hardy and Darby Allen next week on Dynamite. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, for me, I like it because now it gives them stakes to fight for instead of just having uh, a match just to have it. Um, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be real cool how this plays out, how Darby uh, wrestles against Jeff Hardy. Of course, the aesthetic. You know, what makeup is Jeff Hardy going to wear? What makeup is Darby going to wear? Um, honestly, I hope they start the I hope they start dynamite with this match. Um, that would be so cool because Jeff Hardy's still over. Darby Allen is an up and comer that's uh, growing his popularity, and to have those guys start off dynamite, man, this is going to be really cool. Um, let's see what happens with Darby and Jeff Hardy, but man, I'm looking forward to that match. Um, like I said, it's a dream match. Check out my analysis as far as. Uh, that dream match, Jeff, uh, Jeff Hardy and uh, Darby Allen. But man, let let's see what happens. So, this is my review for the May fourth episode of AEW Dynamite. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Follow House of Wrestling on all social media platforms. Follow me, Dedrin One Hundred and Eighty, on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave this video with a thumbs up on YouTube, uh, so that way, the more thumbs up you leave me. The more people can find my uh, videos. Um, but with that also, like I always end most of my videos, stop fighting over wrestling, man. There's so much wrestling happening. I know this Sunday we're going to have uh, WrestleMania Backlash. Hey, it's wrestling. When you're a wrestling fan, you'll watch whatever wrestling's on. You, you don't care, man. Uh, so looking forward to how that plays out uh, with the, uh, WrestleMania Backlash. But again... Man, stop fighting over wrestling. Enjoy it. There's so much to watch. All right. With that, I'm out.